two lectures on succinct arguments. I'll, I'll explain shortly what they are. And in the afternoon, we will discuss uh, uh, zero knowledge proofs. Okay? So the plan for today is rather simple. First, I have to tell you uh, what are arguments. Okay? Uh, then I want to uh, motivate why we should study arguments as opposed to, say, proofs. I'll explain the difference in a moment. And the reason is that they can be succinct, and that's a good thing. Okay? And uh, then I will get into the technical part of the talk, which is you know, how do we construct succinct arguments. Okay? Once again, I will, you know, even though zero knowledge and succinctness are, are great together, uh, we'll, we'll really not discuss zero knowledge this morning. This will be mostly left to the afternoon. Okay? Um, all right, so to explain what is an argument, I have to first recall you what is a proof. Okay, so uh, here's a review uh, from yesterday morning. Um, and also today we'll be mostly working with uh, languages that have witnesses. So um, to make it easier to talk about them, I'll just really talk about relations. So uh, remember that relation is a set of pairs where you have an X as your instance, W as your witness. Okay, for example, X could be a Boolean formula and W would be the corresponding, corresponding satisfying assignment. Okay. Uh, when I say the language for the relation, I really mean all instances uh, uh, for which there is a witness. Okay. And yesterday we saw the notion of an interactive proof that I'll sometimes denote just IP, um, which is a pair of uh, a probabilistic polynomial time interactive algorithms, the prover and the verifier, denoted P and V, for which you have two properties. Okay. The first property is completeness. Okay. It says that uh, for every pair in the relation, if you hand this pair to the prover and you just give the uh, instance to the verifier and they talk, okay, at the end of this interaction, the verifier says, I'm convinced with probability one. Also, I added here a security parameter. Yesterday there was a question about what happens to a, kind of the error for the proof system. In general, you can think about that both the prover and the verifier have some security parameter, say lambda, that controls uh, the other case, right, soundness, right? In this case here, um, when the instance happens to not be in the language of the relation, then no matter which prover is showing up to talk with the verifier, the verifier will make sure that he's convinced with probability at most, you know, some error that, you know, uh, should go down very fast with the security parameter. So you should think about this error to be something like, you know, two to the minus lambda. Okay. So this is, we've seen uh, yesterday, some constructions of interactive proofs, most notably uh, the sum check protocol. Okay. And today we want to talk about arguments. So what is the main difference between an argument and a proof is that we are going to make a tiny change in the definition. And specifically, we're going to consider a relaxation of the soundness property. So let's call it, you know, two prime here. And we're going to call this computational soundness. To denote the fact that we are going to require security or you know, soundness only against provers that are efficient. Okay. So what does efficient mean precisely? Well, it depends. There's a number of ways you can uh, uh, formalize it. In a uniform computational model, you can just say it is a probabilistic polynomial time algorithm. You could also consider non-uniform computational models and say it's a family of polynomial size circuits. Okay. So, but Roughly speaking, it means it's computationally bounded in some way, okay? typically in, in time resources. Uh, as opposed to an interactive proof where it really could be un un unbound unbounded in any resource. Okay? So the first point that I want to make is, so regarding what are arguments, is that oh, I should change the name as well here. So now we're looking at an argument, and let's say it's an IA, right? So <clears throat> interactive arguments relax interactive proofs. OK, so it's just relaxation. Yes? So is the probability now also over coins flipped by the prover? It was actually already such uh, uh, in the prior definition. It just happens to be the case that there is, uh, um, since you're anyways maximizing over all such provers, the provers might as well have the best coin tosses uh, uh, fixed sort of in its heart. Right? Uh, and here, it depends on which computational model you consider. For example, with polynomial size circuits, you could in general just fix the best uh, randomness. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. But in general, yeah, you can just think about it. The probability is over the space of randomness for the prover and the verifier. Yeah. 
Okay, so interactive arguments relax, relax interactive proofs, okay? Uh, it's important to realize that relax, this relaxation is meaningful, right? So it's true that we are syntactically saying... Relaxation is a bigger set or a smaller set when you say... Yeah. Well, it's a, it is easier to achieve an interactive argument than it is to achieve an interactive proof simply because... Yeah, things that you can... Every, every interactive proof is an, is an IA. Every, every interactive proof is an interactive argument, okay? So maybe let's put it in a set theoretic picture. Here's a set of interactive proofs and it is contained in a set of interactive arguments, okay? Relaxation in that you have more such objects, okay? It's important to realize, realize that this relaxation is meaningful. What does meaningful mean? It means that anyways, in the real world or in applications, we are rarely confronted with unbounded adversaries. You know, quite the contrary. Usually we are confronted with bounded adversaries. This is analogous to you know, many other similar relaxations we make in computer science all the time. Maybe a very sort of notable one is when we relax the notion of information theoretic encryption, you know, Shannon-like, to computational notions like semantic security so that we can actually do things like public key encryption. Okay? So, <clears throat> all right, so that's the definition. It's actually pretty simple. Uh, now we want to ask why study them, right? So in general, just like with encryption, we relax information theoretic security to computational security because we can go do more, okay? Now we want to sort of uh, uh, try to sharpen what is it that we couldn't do with interactive proofs that we would like to do now with arguments, okay? So, <clears throat> The answer should be not, you know, because proofs have limitations, right? And I want to first highlight, you know, one such limitation, okay? So, example, <clears throat> let's consider um, the SAT relation. So, what is it? Well, it's just uh, you have phi, which is a Boolean formula, so it maps, say, n bits to uh, one bit. <coughs> uh, and w is the witness, so it's an assignment to the n variables of the formula that makes the formula true. Okay? So let's focus for a moment on this relation, and Let's consider kind of the trivial proof system for SAT where <clears throat> the prover sends the witness to the verifier who checks it, right? So in this case, the communication complexity is n bits, right? Because we're just sending the, the witness, right? Notice that this is a proof system because by definition, if if the formula is satisfiable, then there is a witness that the prover can send. And if it's not, then there is no witness that the prover can send that will make the verifier accept. Let's ask a basic question, you know, <clears throat> could it be that there is some way to convince the verifier using either a non-interactive or interactive proof by sending less than n bits? Okay, so could it be the interactive proofs save us in communication? Okay, so we would like something like you know, some conversation, possibly using some check or, you know, some other, you know, sneaky low degree extensions like we saw yesterday, some, something sort of non-trivial, that makes <clears throat> the verifier uh, accept when phi is satisfiable and uh, uh, reject with high probability when it's not. And the communication is, say, much, much less than n, say, for example, square root of n, okay? So that would be nice. Uh, Maybe even before thinking about this question, let's think about here. Do we, would we expect maybe something slightly non-trivial, you know, some proof, maybe smarter, smaller than n bits? Could we expect something like that? It's a non-rhetorical question. <laughs> so, would you believe that, uh, uh, would you expect that it is possible to have just non-interactive proof where I send some string less than n bits Right, clearly, if I send the witness, then those are n bits, right? So maybe I can do something else altogether, just very different. One message that cons considers, for example, square root of n bits. Is that something we would expect? 
guess there would be a witness then. Mm -hmm. That would also be a witness. And in particular, yeah? You have two n, two n solutions. You, if you want to convince me, you have to give me information theoretic. You have to give me n. Yeah, and we, exactly. And so we have a sort of a ways to capture this intuition that SAT is sort of kind of 2 to the n hard. We have things, for example, like the exponential time hypothesis, OK? It's not quite applicable here because the verifier maybe could flip coins. So really, exponential time hypothesis talks about deterministic time. But we do believe that you know, SAT is kind of 2 to the n hard, right? And if we had some way to send less than n information, say square root of n, then we could just go over all the proofs and check them, right? And that would, make in, that would imply some probabilistic algorithm that runs in 2 to the root n time for solving SAT, OK? So this is something we can't expect here. OK? So we cannot expect the sort of size of the proof to be, say, root or little low of n if we believe sat is 2 to the omega of n hard. OK? And again, here, there is some really need to be a little bit precise here because we're talking about probabilistic uh, time. OK, but that's just an uninteractive proof, right? Maybe we can do something smart across multiple messages, OK? What about here? Could we expect something square root n communication, maybe over a logarithmic number of rounds or something like that? So it's less clear, right? Because you know, if you think about all the possibilities, it's a tree that potentially maybe you can't control or it's hard to think about. Uh, okay, we're not going to think about it online. Yep. So, quick question. So, yes. the argument you presented, is that an intuition or a proof? So, this one? The, yeah. Because the verifier is bounded, and you know, maybe if it runs in more time, it could figure out that the, the statement that was sent was not a, you know, something like, does it create any issues or anything? It, it can be turned into a proof. So, I'll tell you what are the so considerations that you need to take into account to turn it into a proof. One is the running time. Well, you know, the verifier was running in polynomial time, so maybe it's not such a big uh, 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 consideration. More importantly is the randomness complexity of the verifier. So you cannot, in general, run over all the possible settings of the random tape of a probabilistic polynomial time algorithm. What you can do, though, is to approximate uh, its acceptance probability. And because you, have a, you will have a, a constant gap between yes and no, then you can, uh, in, in polynomial time, sort of decide the difference. And then you can you basically send the algorithm is as follows. You loop over all the possible proofs. And for each proof, you approximate the decision probability of the verifier using sampling. That's proof. <laughs> um, good question. So OK, we'll not get into the uh, actual argument. But let me say that you know, there is a theorem. Uh, it's a very nice uh, paper by Goldrick and Hastad. Uh, that says that even with multiple rounds, you can't expect much. In fact, there is a general result that says that if you have uh, interactive proof for a relation R with communication C, okay, then you can decide R in two to the O of C times poly a uh, probabilistic time. OK? So this kind of go over all the possibilities kind of carries over in some indirect way also to the case of a tree. Essentially is the fact that the depth of the tree is not very much, right? It's polynomially depth, deep, OK? The fan out because it's bounded in communication is also not very large. So it costs you like 2 to the c to explore it. And the main technicality is precisely having to do with randomness. You, kind of need to, you cannot actually materialize the whole tree because the fan out from the, prover, from the verifier moves is very big because it can have potentially a lot of randomness. Um, but the fact that there's small communication means that you can actually approximate it reasonably well. Okay? So this is telling us that for any relation, and in particular for the SAT relation, if we have C in communication complexity, then we can decide in 2 to the order of C. And so if we believe that SAT is 2 to the order of n hard, we also cannot expect an interactive proof that saves us in communication um, over, say, the trivial proof. OK? This is all to say is that interactive proofs are quite 
limited when it comes to discussing non-deterministic languages or like communicating witness. They don't save you in communication complexity there. Okay, so there are other limitations we can talk about for interactive proofs, but this is the one I want to highlight now. Is it clear? All right. So <clears throat> now the both arguments, the one that we discussed and the one, or rather, both, uh, I'm running out of English words, um, both strategies to prove this, uh, these statements um, uh, really apply to proofs. If you kind of try to go through uh, that strategy in the argument case, okay, it just doesn't go through. Okay, so this leaves open the door of maybe we can have arguments do something great for us. For example, maybe convincing a verifier that a formula is satisfiable by communicating only logarithmic number of bits. Okay, that would be nice. So this is wanna, what I wanna sort of uh, um, formalize next. I wanna um, put down the goal of a succinct argument, okay? So, yes? It's a, it's a very good question. The question is, uh, it, Am I bounding communication just from prover to verifier or also from verifier to prover? If you look in this paper, there are four different theorems that consider a number of considerations. You know, is your interactive proof public coin or not? And are you um, um, bounding only one direction or the other? Right now, the particular statement that I have here considers communication that is bounded in both directions. If you bound only one direction, kind of the, this thing gets a little bit more messy. Good question. Follow up paper by a colleague of Adam and Wiggles on that addresses the Laconic case, right? Addr addressing that's what? That sounds, yeah, exactly. So if you, if you care, yeah, thank you, Val. If you care specifically about one direction, then the state of the art is actually not in this paper. There's a, there's a follow up, a follow up one. And what does it say? I don't remember the exact statement, you, Val. Do you yeah, that uh, you can simulate uh, in core non deterministic time to do those. So if the communication from the prover to the verifier is C, then you can simulate in core non deterministic time to do the order of C, which effectively says the same, effectively means the same conclusion that it's unlikely to have laconic, uh, non trivially laconic proofs considering only prover to verifier communication. Thank you. Okay. So. Uh, why study arguments? Because proofs are limitations. Okay, so now let's uh, talk about uh, uh, what are succinct. No, ah, I don't have it. So, me. what are succinct arguments? Okay, right. so. <clears throat> we're going to take a step back and instead of talking about the specific uh, SAT relation, we're going to consider a kind of universal relation, a relation that talks about all satisfiability problems kind of together. Okay? Uh, so let's call this relation R star. Okay? It, uh, <coughs> the instances in R star uh, are, consist of triples actually. It's a, you can think about it as an algorithm or a program, an input, and a time bound. So that's kind of your X. And then you have a witness. Okay, and <clears throat> an instance witness is in the relation R star if the algorithm or program accepts the input Z and witness W in at most T steps. Okay. So if, you, for example, you want to express the SAT relation through this language, well, what you do is you consider Z to be the formula at hand, okay? You would set A to be the program that given a formula and a witness will just check its satisfiability. So this is kind of like a general uh, language for all satisfiability problems, okay? You can think about it, this is just, you know, non-deterministic time, right? Yes? Wait, A only needs to be correct on one input, Z, or confused? Like, again, <clears throat> I am really specific, it's kind of per program, right? So I'm saying, I give you a specific program and a specific input, right? And I'm asking for this program, a specific input, is there a witness that makes the program accept in at most these steps? Now you can recover relations such as SAT by considering the same program and different inputs. Okay, so you can fix you know, the program A SAT, right? That will consider as input things that look like that. And it will sort of, and for the same program, you can also consider 
um, you know, different relay, a different. But like uh, some garbage relation that just happens to be correct on C would also be, uh, be an argument. Yeah, yeah. So you can also put stupid programs that are completely uninteresting. Yeah. So it's a universal, so it includes intelligent problems and stupid problems. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, t is, in give, is very important that T is given in binary, uh, and I'll get to that uh, later. So the size of T is log T. Okay. In fact, it will be very important right now because I'm <clears throat> going to define a, a succinct argument. So we're going to say an interactive argument. for our star is succinct if <clears throat> two conditions hold. By the way, before we get to these two conditions, when I, when, I, when I say the phrase interactive argument for our star, I'm already inheriting the completeness and soundness properties for interactive argument for the specific relation R star, right? So I don't need to write them again. Now, instead, I'm going to talk about is the efficiency properties that come for, with succinctness. Let me actually use A and B instead of a 1 and 2. One is that the communication complexity is small. How small? Well, poly in the security parameter, which you know, generally you cannot avoid, and the logarithm of the running time. Okay, so it's kind of, if you think about this, this is essentially exponentially small than, so we'll come back to, the, uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. Let me first write down the properties. Commission complexity is small, and the verification time is also small. How small? Uh, well, can I, I would like to write the same expression, but for the verifier, I can't quite write the same expression. Can anybody say, see why? Could I, could I really write again? poly lambda and log t? Has to, read the input. has to read the input, right? So at the very least, I should be nice enough and let the verifier read the instance that it's checking. So it will be poly in the description of the program, okay? In uh, the size of its input in, uh, and log t. Right? So if you, if you took, a, if you only considered a alone, then you, did, you could just stick to the syntax of proofs before and just not talk about this uniformity condition. Excuse me, if I stuck so what? If you only made a communication complexity requirement, then you would not have to change the syntax from before, right? So before you had just a, like you could talk about a, a just succinct in terms of communication, and here you're making both communication and computational requirements? Yeah, because uh, let me maybe be a, uh, uh, so succinctness is a rather, I guess, fluid uh, notion. <laughs> uh, sometimes people care about this, sometimes care people about both this and that, or even relaxations thereof. So any non-trivial communication complexity over, say, the size of the witness is generally like a good, it's a good thing. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you will, if you kind of consult the literature, succinctness will be used for a, a, so a number of these uh, of the different uh, uh, goals about either communication alone or, or both communication and verification time. These specific ones are to some extent a, sort of a very extreme settings of these parameters, and the reason why I'm putting them down is because they are achieved by the classical constructions that we'll discuss. But like then later today we'll talk about uh, things that achieve this language to describe the different notions? Maybe, you know, like, how would you describe something like a bullet proofs? Uh, there are, you know, I guess, office jargon that I don't know if it's worthy of, uh, uh, you know, uh, being enshrined in uh, terminology, but at least in my head, um, these two properties, um, I like to think about it as, you know, either proof or, or communication succinct. The proof succinct is kind of a bit of a misnomer because it's anyways an argument, okay? But, uh, and then the other one is kind of verification succinct or verifier succinct. The point being is that, you know, if you, you qualify the adjective succinct, then you denote which thing ought to be small. Uh, in general, of course, if you say that this is small, this can't be too big either, right? So uh, this is a slightly stronger goal, okay? Up to the fact that here you have some parameters that, you know, maybe don't usually appear in that. I, I think this uh, taxonomy of different notions of succinctness will become 
necessarily explicit uh, uh, in the first workshop at the end of September, simply because there are many works that explore different trade-offs here. For today, I want to try to mostly keep it under the carpet, uh, because we'll discuss only one construction that achieves this specific setting of parameters, which is a, a rather a, a demanding uh, uh, setting of parameters. Sorry. Uh, yes. This, this definition is it for all A, Z, and W in R star? That is correct, yes. Yeah. So that, this is for R star, and then for every, every sort of tuple in, uh, in, in, in R star, this is what you want to achieve. Okay. This basically says you get to read the input, okay, but not much more, as a verifier. And this says that uh, you, you, know, you send you know, exponentially fewer bits than a, this kind of a trivial proof system. Maybe to put this in pictures, kind of the picture you should have in mind is that there is a big Hulky prover that gets as input <clears throat> so the instance and the witness. And, and then there is this tiny, tiny kind of interaction with a tiny verifier uh, that only gets as input the instance. OK? Oops, so I'm using x instead of z. Sorry. And this should be compared against kind of the trivial proof system where <clears throat> the prover uh, you know, gets the same, z same inputs. But all it does is it sends w, which could be enormous, right? I mean, w could be upwards of size t. And the verifier you know, has to read it all and check it. Uh, by running uh, that computation. So it's like you know, a bit of a stupid proof system, but the point is that kind of you have this exponential uh, reduction in communication and verification time. Okay? So this kind of what succinctness buys you. Okay? Yes. I guess I'm just having trouble with the intuition of what's the point of separating A and C? Like A might not even halt for any input other than Z, right? So you're just trying to say that like some computation with some like, input does yeah. everything. So like, why are A and Z these separate quantities? Uh, at this point, it is not justified. Uh, it is, I find it more natural, but you could consider that A comes with Z hard-coded in it. For actual constructions, actually, it is helpful to, behave, to treat A and Z separately, because sometimes you can play some tricks. Well, first, there are different uh, time complexity associated to A and Z. Okay? And second, sometimes you can have tricks around uh, pre-processing where kind of uh, for the same A, you do some computation that <coughs> across different Z's you benefit from. Okay. And then also just the analogy to SAT, I find it more explicit because you fix the SAT program and the SAT program kind of looks at the particular instance for today. And it's easier to recover specific NP, NP relations this way. So I find it slightly more natural. The A is a deterministic <coughs> algorithm or probabilistic algorithm? Deterministic. If you have some randomness, you have to put it uh, here. So in general... W, w can be, cannot be exponential because uh, then it will take more than uh, the T will be. We'll have to be, we'll have to read W, A, Z, W. At least A has to read W. Uh, a, well, in the here, yes, but not here, right? So that's the point. So that uh, <coughs> in an argument system, for our star, the verifier only receives as input the instance, which is A, Z, and T. Okay? T is in binary. Okay? So T could be exponentially bigger than it, well, it is exponentially bigger than its representation. So in particular, the verifier, by running in this time, could run exponentially faster than the witness size. Okay? Yes, David. Um, so, sorry to keep her brain, so I just want to make sure I understand, but you're saying that this has to work for all A, right? The, the argument has to work for, for all for, a. for which you have a true theorem, right? So for example, if A decides not to halt, then the prover will not be in a position to prove any theorems, right? right? But that means that if you were to pre-process on A, that would, the pre-processing would even have to work on the dumb A's that don't halt on certain inputs. Uh, Again, for any true theorem, right? So like, if, if you have some input on which A does something that is an, an, an interesting in particular, maybe doesn't halt, then you will have just not a true theorem that you can prove things about. It might be true of some Z's or one Z and 
But you have to specify which z, right? So it, it, if you, it, yeah, if you bring a z to the table uh, and you know conc at concrete time bound for which a is doing is accepting uh, uh, for some w, then, then then sure you can you can do that. But you're saying, but the preprocessing, which usually you'd want to do it on things like SAT or something that are uh, that preprocessing also has to work on these weird functions that. Yeah. At the end of the day, because this is universal, the machinery that will be brought to bear will barely interpret what is inside A. It will treat it as a universal machine of some sort. Uh, so, okay. Now, as abstract as this sounds, the guarantees are all too useful in a sense that uh, even as we speak, you know, there are Ethereum contracts <laughs> that are deployed on some test nets that implement a verifier and benefit from the exponential savings over na native computation. So these are things that, despite sort of this you know, rather uh, abstract nature, at the end of the day, be precisely because the language is universal, you can you know, put in it you know, problems of interest and benefit from exponential savings in running time. Okay? Okay, so I'll try to keep this here, this definition of succinct arguments, and I want to transition to constructing them, okay? Um, no. More questions about the definition or motivation? Okay, so maybe one tedious question. Yes, so like, uh, I love tedious questions. The, uh, so this is very similar to Barry Goldrack universal arguments, right? But there they restrict T to be at most n to the C. I haven't really been precise about the, 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 the um, against what provers do I want to be secure against. Uh, so Barak and Goldreich say they specifically want t to be potentially you know, super, you know, super polynomial, right? No, it, yeah, it's to the n to the c for every c. Right. But so here you allow t to be anything, so it could be exponential even, right? Uh, not, uh, not quite. It depends. Sort of. Uh, I haven't really, you know, quantified you know, things against t, right? Did, did I? No, but the universal language allows t to be of the same size as a and z and. Yeah, but. I, the question is, you know, when I come back here and express it through here, do I put any any bounds on t, for example? Do I want do I want to restrict t to be poly, any arbitrary polynomial in, in the security parameter? Mm -hmm. So that would, for example, address this uh, consideration. And uh, maybe let me say explicitly, I, I'm right now I'm for simplicity. I'm assuming that t is always taken to be some arbitrary polynomial in the security parameter, so that I don't have to worry about, you know. So, literally exponential, like something super polynomial. Though there are technical ways to handle through complexity leveraging uh, some things that are you know, slightly above super polynomial. So t is actually log uh, lambda bits. Yeah. yeah, for example, uh, let's say that. Uh, so it's not even uh, super logarithmic. I, in the security proofs that I will show today, it will be like a. That's a restriction no, no, on log, log lambda, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yes. Okay. Is there a restriction in the sense that, uh, yeah. This is more of a technicality. It's, it's not really necessary. Even for the constructions I will discuss, you can actually sort of, uh, uh, you can, with the right setting with security parameter, you can actually scale up well beyond NP all the way up to NEXP. Basically, what you say is that lambda is O of log T. Lambda. Yes. Okay. Or rather, no, log, log t is O of lambda. So I want log t to be O of lambda. Of, uh, I mean, how do you choose to put it in lambda? Wait, let, me, let, me, let me write the. I'm saying I choose this parameter to be log t. There we go. Okay, okay. So I think the, the, bi the binary thing was confusing, at least me. So the running time of the computation is some polynomial in the security parameter, okay? <laughs> and this is not necessary, but is, is very many constructions require it, not all, and uh, certainly it is uh, it, it is a cozy feeling to think that. Um, more, more questions. All right. All right I'm tempted to uh, delete this one. I think we're all comfortable with it. All I'm deleting is just the definition of an interactive argument. Okay. Remember, it's just like an interactive proof, but soundness is computational.
right. So now we get to three. How to construct succinct arguments? <clears throat> There's actually a long answer. Okay, there are many, many. Uh, uh, beautiful and different constructions of succinct arguments. Uh, and uh, I think many of them will be displayed um, either through seminars here or the first workshop. Today specifically we'll focus on one, okay? It's uh, kind of the first such construction. It's a classical construction from the 80s um, due to Joe Killian, okay? So, and specifically, uh, we'll see how to uh, transform any sort of PCP with you know good enough parameters, we'll come back to that in a moment, uh, into a succinct argument. Okay, so this is a construction Killian 92. Um, <clears throat> so we had two lectures on PCPs yesterday. I just remind you via a picture uh, how they look like, okay? And that will be enough for our use today because we're mostly using them, we'll be using them as a black box. <clears throat> so the starting point is that, is a theorem. Um, actually the very same um, paper uh, that uh, Prahlad discussed yesterday and gave a, sort of a taste of the construction that essentially, you know, in, in this language, or rather in this uh, a, a, a terminology, you could basically say that R star has good PCPs, okay? So what does it mean? So let's put down a picture of how, what does good mean? So you have a PCP prover that will spit out a long proof. I'll just denote it capital Pi, just to know that it's big. The prover, you know, in this case, will take as input a, z, t, and w. Okay. The proof will si will be will have size that is poly t. In fact, the construction. I mean, for today it will suffice to have poly t, but you know, the particular construction can get you, you know, something pretty close to so something like t to the one plus epsilon. And this uh, <coughs> proof can be um, checked the, by a verifier that, again, gets, gets us input just the instance, okay? In poly, okay, I'm gonna add a security parameter here because we're building some cryptographic construction, so we do care about the security parameter for the line PCP, the sum set for the line PCP to be decent. So the verifier will have a running time that depends on, uh, on the security parameter, and then, just like in a succinct, um, PCP, in a succinct argument, uh, to learn polynomial in its input. Okay, this is just the size of its input, this is the security parameter. What about the running time of the prover? Okay, okay just slightly larger than uh, uh, the time to output um, all these things. So what I meant by good here is specifically just saying that you know the proof is not too big, the time to generate it is not too big, and crucially, the Running time of the uh, verifier is actually small. And maybe, you know, I want to put separately that number of queries that we're making is poly and then log t. <clears throat> okay, so what you saw yesterday as a sort of high level construction of a PCP basically gets you. All these parameters, maybe the one thing that we didn't discuss you know, very carefully yesterday is like how do you make sure the verifier runs fast? Um, but you know, we can't do everything in two hours, right? So, uh, so for now, we're gonna take this as a, as a given. This is a starting point, and this picture is all we're gonna need for today, okay? Are we happy with it? So this is a PCP, just a long proof that can be probabilistically checked by asking a small number of queries and running fast. Okay. Now, <clears throat> all these underlied blue things are very reminiscent of our efficiency goals over there. Um, so maybe it's not surprising that an object like this one has something to do with the construction of succinct arguments. In fact, in fact, let's try to do that. Um, 
So let's try to do a first attempt. Okay, it's going to be you know maybe a bit silly, but uh, I think it's important to um, uh, go through it. So first attempt at what? We want to try to construct a succinct argument from this PCP. Um, <clears throat> so let's say that the prover. Uh, I'm not going to keep writing the inputs to the prover and verifier. So now we have the prover and the verifier for the argument system. And suppose that the first natural attempt would be to, to be something like this. Sample the randomness R for VPCP. So this is the succinct argument verifier. Samples randomness for the PCP verifier. It sends it to the prover. The prover, it produces the PCP. How? It will just invokes the PCP prover on the relevant inputs. It deduces the query set implied by that randomness for this proof. It returns the proof on that query set. Well, this is a small number of queries. And the verifier will decide according to running VPCP, not on the whole proof, but on the particular view of it that was sent. But that's OK, because it's running it on the same randomness. So essentially, what the pro this, pro this protocol attempt is saying, you want to construct a succinct argument. Why not tell the argument verifier to send over which randomness he plans, plans to use? The prover will just produce the proof, this deduce which part of the proof the verifier is interested in, and ship back just the answers to the queries that were made according to this randomness. And then the verifier can then run its decision procedure. Okay. Now, before we get to the security, which is Turns out it's questionable. Um, are we happy syntactically what this protocol is saying? Yes. The reason for putting PyQ as a superscript, VPCP doesn't get to read all of it? Or? Well, <clears throat> on a particular randomness and really input, the verifier has a particular view. It says, or uh, is interested in a particular view. On this randomness, it says, I want to look at locations 5, 10, and 12. Now. The prover, in, my, in principle, would have been happy to send the entire proof. But remember, the proof is big, it's poly t. So that's going to be way over budget for us, because you know, we want poly log t. No, but it reads all of pi of q, please, to these PCP. On, across different random strings. But for this particular random string, it's looking specifically at this query set. So I'm sending just that. Okay. Essentially, what we're saying is we're asking the prover to sample the proof for us, okay, with the randomness that I care about today. Why? Because I really can't send the whole proof. It's too long, OK? Probabilistically checkable proofs are long proofs that can be sampled, OK? Doesn't mean they're short proofs, all right? So syntactically, are we OK with this protocol? All right, now let's get to security. Or even, let's maybe talk about efficiency first. Like, this satisfies the properties of a succinct argument from an efficiency perspective. The randomness is small. I didn't say that here, but it's you know polylog t. This is going to be polylog t, okay? What is the verifier doing? Well, it's sampling some randomness and running a PCP verifier, so certainly it's going to be fast, right? But I claim there is some you know, rather uh, 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 glaring issues in security here. What could the prover do to make to make the verifier accept even when it shouldn't? Efficiency R could depend on the length of A here, where technically the one is but. Yes, I didn't really. Yeah, I didn't really talk about uh, the randomness complexity here. But you know, yeah, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, maybe I should say that you know, R should also be you know, poly lambda and log t. Again, the reason why not really highlighting that just you know, all natural constructions <laughs> like have this property um, since I'm sending the randomness. Okay. What is the issue in security here? Clearly, the prover should not know the randomness. Yeah, I mean. That the randomness was random because it should have been, right? So if, if you send the randomness here, 
then the prover can just pick the answers to the randomness to, to make the verifier accept. It's like saying, you know, <coughs> let's, I don't know, bet on a coin flip, and your bet comes after the coin flip lands, right? Come on, like, that's, not how you're, that's not how the coin flip is random, right? If it comes after, then you know the out outcome, right? And then you can bet accordingly. So similarly here, the soundness of a PCP crucially relies on the fact that first you write down the proof, now it's there, then you sample the randomness for the queries, okay? And then this, you have soundness properties. Uh, here, uh, you can't trust the prover to think in his mind a, a proof and not change it when it sees the randomness. Certainly won't do that. But anyway, a more indirect way to, to see that there's something wrong with this protocol is the fact that there's no cryptography here. Everything is information theoretic, and we know that we're not supposed to go anywhere with information theoretic objects <coughs> through these limitations. Okay, so cryptography must come in somewhere. Okay, so I know it's a bit of a stupid protocol, but you know it's important to realize that like, the randomness must come after the proof you know, has come into existence. Okay, the more stupid one is that the prover chooses R. Yeah, yeah, a more stupid one is R choose, uh, prover chooses R and then sends directly. And that would be like a non-interactive <laughs> candidate. Yes. Sort of not show me, but commit to the. Good, but you know, as, exactly as as stupid as this protocol is, it kind of crystallizes the, the main issue is that we want the prover to commit to the proof. Okay, that's exactly how we're going to fix it, and so that's why. You know, this is my opinion, Killian's protocol is really beautiful because it's a really, really, really simple construction of succinct argument. You know, once you have hidden all of the PCP machinery away into like a nice picture, okay? <laughs> so now let's fix this protocol. The better attempt would be to make the prover commit to pi first, and only then send R. Okay, and we'll be using cryptography for committing. Now. <clears throat> <coughs> There's something that to be still said here, you know, how are we going to commit to this long string, right? For example, let's just think uh, in terms of uh, you know, maybe, you know, practical cryptography for a moment. Say, say that I use SHA-256, okay, to commit to pi. If I just kind of hash it, like normally, later, like how do I decommit to it for you, right? So I have to somehow use a particular way of committing to this long pi such that later I can reveal to you small bits and pieces of it, right? So this calls to arms a very important sort of data structure or paradigm in computer science, which is a what? Merkle, Merkle trees, right? So I, I, I assume that everybody have heard, has heard what is a Merkle tree, but who has seen a Merkle tree? <laughs> okay, so I'm not going to go through it, right? So we're going to be using a Merkle tree. And specifically, the main property that we need is, so we actually don't need, in this case, a general purpose cryptographic hash function. It will suffice to have one that has the property of collision resistance, okay? So <clears throat> um, just to remind you, you know, sort of what collision resistance means, uh, since simply because we'll be using it later. So, you know, we'll have a hash function family. So what does this mean? It means that you know, we have a family of distributions over hashes, one per security parameter, is collision resistant. If for every efficient bad guy a tilde to be distinguished from the algorithm A, which presumably is more useful, um, the probability for a random hash function sampled from uh, HK that uh, um, the adversary outputs two uh, kind of uh, pre-images given the description of a hash function, and these are different but collide, 
is so-called negligible in the security parameter, okay? which means like you know it, it vanishes uh, uh, faster than in the inverse of any polynomial. Okay, so this is just for those of you that maybe haven't seen what collision resistance means. It's you know it can be written down as a formal definition. Here it is, and you can build a Merkle tree using this particular any uh, any hash function. And in this protocol, we'll be using just this property. Uh, sometimes you use other properties of hash functions. Anyway, so let's write down the protocol. Um, <clears throat> the first thing that the verif verifier is going to do, it's going to sample the hash function description. And it will say to the prover, please use this particular hash function to build your Merkle tree. But anyway, just. Uh, <clears throat> To understand why is it even a distribution over hash functions? Because if you fix a particular hash function, a particular prover attacking you may have been born with collisions in its heart, right? So somehow you want to defeat these kind of pre-computed collisions by sampling the hash function yourself. Okay. So now the prover knows which hash function it should be using. So as you can see there's no randomness yet uh, about the PCP, right? So the prover will produce the PCP using the PCP prover. And it will commit to the PCP. And let's say you know, it, kind of, it computes the root, which is you know, some Merkle tree procedure that depends on h and pi. Okay. And it says, here's the root of the Merkle tree that I have thought about uh, today. Okay. So, the verifier for now pockets the root. Uh, uh, it's just waiting for later. And now it samples the randomness. Sample PCP randomness R. Now it sends it. Okay. The prover now can deduce the query set Q for this randomness. And it also computes or, you know, prepares, you know, computes the so-called authentication paths for the locations in Q. What does this mean? It means that Q will determine certain locations in the proof, and the prover will just assemble the authentication paths that certify or that reveal, that sort of, yeah, that, that, that authenticate each of these locations against the root. So in replying, it will say, here are the answers, you know, pi sub q, pi restricted to q, and here are the paths. And now, the, the number of paths is that it's also fixed somewhere before, or there will be a, at least in the simplest uh, construction, one path per query. Because in the tree, so once you have a leaf, you look at the, it's not quite the path, it's like the co-path, right? It's kind of all the siblings of everything on, from you to the, to the root. And this would be a list of paths, one per query, and per answered query there. And now, so we will basically check the paths with respect to the root that you received earlier and the query set Q, which you can compute yourself. And then, like before, now you can decide according to that verifier. Pi is restricted to Q, and then you provide all the inputs. So for, I think you know, some of you have seen this protocol many, many times. So, but uh, I, um, some of you haven't. And it is a beautiful protocol. Okay? If you're sort of wondering how you construct a succinct argument, it's actually really simple. You just start with any PCP, right? And you do this commit first and reveal later paradigm. Okay? Uh, in this way, you're basically uh, harnessing the probabilistically checkable nature of these long proofs, and you're turning them into like a sort of succinct arguments. Because you never actually have to send this long proof. It's only materialized in the head of the prover. Uh, now, what I want to do right now is 
just let me check the time. Oh, perfect. Uh, <clears throat> what we're going to do uh, after the break is I actually want to go ahead and try to analyze this. There's something uh, interesting in uh, something. Certainly the, the intuition is strong for what this protocol makes sense. Uh, but when I do try to analyze it, it's a rather simple proof, but there is some slightly non-trivial realizations in the proof that I want to try to highlight. Okay. And, and then what we'll do, we'll discuss how um, this succinct argument can actually be made non-interactive, which is the non-interactivity non of succinct arguments is something you know, really well motivated in the blockchain setting, which is one of the uh, application domains of, uh, in this program. Yes? So can I just ask, um, um, in the PCPs that uh, at least we saw yesterday were very, very generous about the size of the proof. Yes. If you now take a um, you know a path in a Merkle tree route on a very very long proof, you'll end up with something linear if you're not careful, right? Uh, well, it will be it will be still logarithmic, right? Because whatever. In the very very long proof, which in the examples we saw yesterday. Oh, well, in the exponential size, you would yeah you would not be using exponential size like exp t, that would be bad, and this construction cannot harness that. Though interestingly, there are other constructions. Um, that use different type of cryptography that can harness uh, those type of expo exponential size PCPs because they use the linear structure without materializing the whole evaluation table. So in general, most interesting PCPs, even if they're not quite sort of a, 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 the sort of standard setting of parameters, lead to some type of succinct argument. You just need to bring to bear the right cryptography uh, um, with it. Um, actually, it's a very, uh, it's a surprisingly interconnected and uh, Kind of a dense area of, of uh, ideas that uh, it's this interplay between information theoretic, non trivial results about checking computation and then corresponding implications to cryptography. It's kind of it's a very effective dance um, that uh, has been going on for some years now. But today we'll be looking specifically at how to harness polynomial size PCPs, okay? Uh, for which this actually we'll start the next uh, lecture with. Accounting. We'll, we'll make sure that the parameters make sense, uh, and then we'll get into the uh, security reduction. Okay. Oh, yes. Do we really need the uh, like the full assumption of collision resistance, or is it like has there been? Do you know of any work? Has there been some work saying like because right like collision resistance says give me any collision, but it's not clear from any collision how I break this protocol. Right? I need a collision on two PCPs or two parts of PCPs, or I need a collision on two outputs of hashes, so is it like in the random oracle model, maybe, you know, some way to use a, an even simpler assumption? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. I'm not aware of uh, progress in that direction. More generally, you can ask, can one construct succinct arguments on one-way functions? And uh, I'm not aware of progress there, either positively or negatively. Maybe so you... Oh, yes, good. We can, we can relax this to multi-collision resistance. Thank you. And what that will do, it will help you, uh, I think, with a round somewhere. Yeah. And uh, you can relax it there. But uh, further, yeah. That's uh, sort of a, maybe a strong, like a different style of assumption. That's not necessarily a weaker assumption. <coughs> no, no. The, forget the key list. The key multi-collision uh, that's, uh, that's, yeah. oh, that's a strict The yes. money yes. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's a strict relaxation. Yeah. Yeah, I think they, they actually show some kind of like gradual way of moving from one functions to collision resistance via this multi collision resistance, like every more multi gives you more power. But and starting from one way functions yeah, or close the, have, yeah, and, and that's in terms of the assumption of the collision no, the, the, the hash function. And then there are construction that uh, do not just uh Mercury at first do some error correcting coding and it's more fancy mm -hmm. in Mercury to account for that they can do. It. It's not clear that anything is practical but <laughs> but that's a different story. Yeah. 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 Uh, so thank you. I don't remember exactly, but I don't think from one in functions you don't get uh, yeah. you don't yeah. get six sit. That's only hiding. Yeah. You need MCRH. Yeah. That's a relaxation. Yeah, yeah but, but the, the, the thing that's weaker than actual full fledged CRH, at least potentially weaker than full fledged CRH, right? Yeah. You allow resistance against collisions of finding like you know ten collisions. Yeah, MCRH is weaker than CRH. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's not. Yeah, yeah, I think the MCRH is an actual relaxation, uh, and uh, beyond that, I'm actually. The seeded one. Yeah. And even if you assume collision resistance, Merkle trees are still the best. Uh, as far as. Uh, 
Yeah, so, uh, yeah. I would say so. Is there any wow. proofs of optimality? <laughs> I think that would be very nice to prove. You're saying it's theory? Well, you're going to be subjected. Yeah, yeah but, so, but that does our st structured like, things. Right? You, you can actually, you can, uh, instead of thinking about constructing something out of just a plain CRH, you can just to f try to formulate what was the Merkle tree doing for me? Well, you know, I was uh, committing to a vector and I was revealing certain positions of the vector. And, you know, as Dan was pointing out, you can use a, 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 any, a number of uh, accumulators based on different number theoretic assumptions that will uh, kind of replace entirely the Merkle tree uh, with, you know, a suitable accumulator. And then you get, a, you know, different uh, trade-offs. In particular, you're able to circumvent this uh, issue of uh, a, a logarithmic size uh, authentication paths, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, both asymptotically and concretely, you know, contribute uh, 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 to proof size. Yeah. Okay, so I think it's a, 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 it's a good time to stop, uh, also because it is time to stop. And so let's uh, uh, resume at 11.